Let's move on to our next question from Nichelle Polston of WHYY. Mr. Kovac, you'll get the first response on this. Nichelle. Okay, we often hear the term fiscal cliff, the automatic spending cuts to be expected at the end of the year, and expiration of the Bush tax cuts. What will you do in Congress to ensure that the right decisions are made when it comes to addressing those matters? What we've seen is an approach in, in Congress where we've continually kicked the can down the road to avoided the tough decisions. We've seen that scenario happen again this year. It, it's, it happens in local governments, it happens in state governments, and it's happening in the federal government, and it's unacceptable. We say, well, we're going to really make these cuts, and we mean it this time. At the local level, well, if we don't make these cuts, we're going to cut police. At the national level, well, if we don't make these cuts, we're going to cut the military. We're facing a 10 percent reduction in our military, which not only affects their ability to perform their duties to keep them safe, but it also affects many people domestically as well, our small businesses that supply to the military. It affects our economy. Making these draconian cuts aren't the answer. What the answer is, is making the reform to the system that we need. We need to reform our safety nets. We need to reform Social Security. We need to reform Medicare. We need to reform our non-discretionary spending and get that under control and make the cuts we need to preserve the programs that the people in need are relying on. I think we need to do a much better job avoiding this fiscal cliff by planning and future planning. The most important thing that Congress can do to uh, help the economy get going again is to pass a fiscal plan that reduces the deficit over the next 10 years by $4 trillion. And I voted on such a plan. It's called, referred to as Simpson Bold. It's fair. It's comprehensive. It's balanced. It protects the middle class. It protects investments, needed investments in education, and, and it involves uh, additional revenue. In doing so, we'll set the table for avoiding the fiscal cliff. The worst thing that we could do is allow all the Bush tax cuts to expire. I've, I've voted to allow those uh, tax cuts for the upper income people to expire. We need to uh, prevent a large uh, tax increase on all uh, Americans. And we need to pr prevent the automatic spending cuts uh, to taking effect at the beginning of the year. I support those spending cuts because Congress proved that it couldn't do its business a year ago last uh, summer uh, with the fiscal cliff debate. We need to avoid uh, this fiscal cliff. We need to reset our tax rates. We need to have a strong fiscal plan for the next 10 years. Mr. Guesty. Uh, we certainly need to uh, avoid the fiscal cliff. I mean, if you take a look at you know, where the cutting of the deficit is going to come from, it's coming mostly uh, on the revenue side. Uh, you're going to see an increase of uh, revenues about 25 to 3 percent of GDP. That means very large tax cuts. And this is, I mean, tax increases. And we do not need tax increases in this economic environment. It's not going to get us anywhere. Congressman Carney talks about cutting spending, and I, I couldn't agree more that we need to cut spending. If you look at the fiscal cliff, it's only cutting spending as a percent of GDP by about half a percent. And we're talking about cutting things that aren't being cut right now. We're cutting increases that were planned. So we really need to take a look at, you know, cutting expenses. We need to look at both sides, sacred cows of both parties. You have domestic welfare and you have the military. Both have to be cut if we're ever going to get to where we need to be with a balanced budget. Mr. August, the time is yours. The fiscal cliff is already here, and there is no way in any direction that we can go but fall off it. There has been chronic spending and chronic printing of money by the Federal Reserve. It's called quantitative easing. They have printed our money and it's made us worthless. So we're going to have to totally revamp the economic model because it has failed. On the worldwide level right now, you see what is happening in Europe. It's because of the bogus financial products been put out by both these parties for the last 20 years. The banking scandal, the, the uh, mortgage fraud, all of this. It was started by these two parties. These two parties must be removed from office. We must need some new fresh thinking and rebuilding our economy. Mr. August raises the possibility the fiscal cliff is inevitable. Anyone care to respond to that or take this uh, further? Well, uh, some kind of fiscal cliff in terms of spending cuts that need to be done has to happen. Democrats and Republicans in agree. They served together on this Simpson-Bowles deficit reduction panel. Agreed that it has to be a balanced plan. It has to have additional revenue, which Republicans tem uh, 
typically object to. It has to have significant spending cuts and in the order of $1 of new revenue to $3 of spending cuts in order to get this. Uh, and the biggest part of all that is co cost containment on the health care side. People don't really understand that, but we, have, we are at the thin end of a wedge for spending on health care as our population ages. Over the next 40 years, the population over 65 is going to double in our country, and that's going to mean that health care costs are going to explode. We need to get those costs under control, and it's got to be part of our fiscal plan. I don't think the uh, fiscal cliff is inevitable if we take action now. I think Mr. Gretzky said what we need to do is get away from the uh, partisan uh, approaches. And uh, Mr. Carney just said, you know, Republicans typically do this or Democrats typically do that. We need to elect leaders that can get beyond what their parties typically do. Yes, Republicans typ typically and have signed on to this pledge to not increase taxes. I think about 90 to 95 percent of congressional uh, candidates, uh, Republicans, have signed on to that pledge. I refuse to sign that pledge because I'm not your typical Republican. That's what we need is leadership that will stand up, not just reach across the aisle, but stand up to their own party and make sure that their own party knows that they are there to represent the people and set an example and then step to the middle of the aisle and bring their, their other colleagues with them. This partisan rhetoric has got to end. We've got to stop blaming the other parties or blaming parties in general. We've got to focus in on our problems. We can't just focus in what we agree on, that 10% that we agree on. We've got to focus on those hard problems that need tough solutions. All right, that's you know, time. Please. You know, I, just, I don't just talk about uh, taking the hard votes. I actually have taken the hard vote on this. I was one of 38 members, only 38 out of 435, who voted for the Bowles-Simpson framework, a balanced framework. 22 Democrats and 16 Republicans were, were willing to take that vote. We're, we're going to have to get 218 votes or more in the House to, uh, to pass a balanced fiscal plan that will put the country back on a strong financial footing into the future. Uh, Simpson, go ahead. Please. Simpson Bowles is another duopolistic party. The word I want to say is a ruse. It didn't make it out of committee. So I don't understand about this voting on this bill. This is another one of those bills that they decide to bring up at the end of the session and do it in the lame duck session to prove that they've done something. But the basic tenements of Simpson Bowles is to strip away the entitlements that the middle class working people have paid for in this country. And that's what the roots of it is. They want you to work till you're 69 and with all the fiscal crisis going on of young people not even having to work, can't get work because there's people still having to work till, they're, till their nails into the ground. So this idea that Simpson Bowles is going to solve any problem, it's going to make it worse. Very good. Mr. Gessie, anything finally to add? I'd like to uh, get your final comment here and then move just in the uh, uh, name of getting things moving along so we have a lot to cover during the course of the morning, but please. Sure. I mean, when you, when you talk about, you know, getting the, the, the budget balanced and bringing things into alignment, yes, we have to cut, but you have to look at the tax system, and we have a fundamentally flawed tax system. Uh, the income tax system, uh, Huffington Post, uh, announced and reported last year that 46 percent of Americans, for whatever reason, don't pay income tax. And although I don't appreciate the way Warren Buffett demagogues the issue of how the, the rich don't pay their share, uh, it, would be, it would be wrong of us not to you know, admit that on, a fict on an effective tax rate basis, uh, the rich don't pay as much as the common working man. So the, the federal income tax system is flawed. You're not going to fix it by tweaking uh, deductions and messing with rates, we need to get rid of it, we need to scrap it completely and replace it with a federal consumption tax. People should be taxed when they consume, not when they earn. Everybody gets to keep all the money that they earn, they get taxed when they spend. This is the closest thing to a fair tax system we're ever going to get.